How do humans? And welcome back to another episode of the Rediscover Human podcast. It is now autumn of 2021. Happy Equinox, everyone. So the other day I went out for a, a stroll. It was um, Saturday morning, just over a week, uh, two weeks ago, I think now, and had the morning to myself, had the day to myself. So the night before, I, I chose a route in my book. I have these ordnance survey walking books. They have 30 walks in and you, I've got about probably 15 of them now from different regions, um, Brecon Beacons, Dartmoor, Peak District, Lake District, um, Snowdonia, Mid Wales, Cornwall, um, a few others that I can't remember, but I, I've, I've got a, a decent amount. Anytime I go to oh, Pembrokeshire, anytime I go to an area, area um, I buy the Ordnance Survey uh, walking book and it has basically circular like 30 circular walks in any area um, that has got you know substantial walking in it and so I have this one for the Brecon Beacons and I, I tried to tick them off and it's probably the closest one I've got to ticking them all off I've done you know around 20 of the 30 routes um, I went for a weekend and ticked three off in two days one time and you know I'm slowly working my way through it but it's Brecon Beacons is between an hour and two hours uh, from my doorstep where I live in Bristol. Um, and it's a lovely, quite wild terrain, never too busy. So it's, it's one of my favourite ones that I'm trying to tick off all these walks from the book. And so, you know, the, the night before I thought I'll choose a route for tomorrow. I've got the day to myself. Feel pretty good on my feet at the moment. You know, there's three different varieties of walk. They have um, green, it's like three to five miles. Blue is about five to seven miles it's done by time rather than miles to be honest so obviously how much uh, altitude you gain in the walk affects the time so it's like two to three hours is a green walk and then you know another time is a blue walk and generally like seven to ten miles or, or four plus hours is a, a orange walk in the book and so I thought I've got the day let me try and do an orange walk take off one of the orange walks from the book I've done about half of them so far um and so I found one, Fanny Big is the name of it. So it's in Wales, so it's they've got Welsh names, um, and they're all they call them the, the Carmarthen Fans or whatever, and the you know Penny Fan, and um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what Fan means to be honest. Some, maybe it's just because it looks kind of like a wave. I think it, maybe it means wave, and they look like waves, something like that. And so Fanny Big was the one I chose to do, a ten mile walk. Got up early, cook, cook, did my breakfast in the rice cooker, put it in my um, thermos flask for the day, and you know got some water and some fruit, um, mushroom crisps, the, the normal kinds, not magic kind, um, and set off. Drove over to Wales on my own, hour and a half drive um, to the start of this walk. Now, as I approached the the car park, I recognised the area very clearly from a walk I'd done about two years previous right up until the car park and then when I looked at the start of the route I thought I've actually done this route previous not from the book from a website before I actually bought a book um, or this book I did the the snow the penny fan horseshoe which is quite a long walk uh, a big loop that's what we call it horseshoe where it like sweeps in a few different of the other nice ridge line and nice mountains nearby in one nice circular walk and so anyway, I set off on this walk and I was like, well, this walk doesn't have Penny Fan in, which is the highest mountain in the Brecon Beacons or South Wales. Um, so I'll just do the, the 10 miles in this. If I still feel good afterwards, maybe I can take off another walk from the book, like a, a shorter walk if there's one nearby and, you know, within half an hour's drive or something. So I set off on the walk, felt good on the climb. I'd just come back from the Lake District uh, a week prior. So my legs were feeling pretty strong for climbing. I'd done Scarfell Pike and Blencathra. Climbed pretty steady, then I and I uh, went past one guy taking photos with the camera about the top of the first climb. Walked along this kind of kind of very relatively flat plateau um, from the car park, and I saw like three figures ahead of me. Uh, one of them had a red jacket on, very clear. Um, and I thought, okay, I'll, you know, that there's not too many people out there. They're quite far way ahead. Maybe eventually I'll overtake them. Um, As so I carried on walking. After about probably 40 minutes, got a bit closer um, and came up behind him and I could actually hear him talking. And just as I approached, 
um, and sort of came past the, the, the three, it was three gentlemen. Um, and as I approached them to start to pass, they said, oh, you might want to keep moving. You don't want to get caught up in this conversation. It'll bring you down. I said, oh, I don't, I don't mind these kind of, kind of talks. What are you talking about? I, couldn't, I didn't, didn't actually hear what they were talking about at the time. I said, oh, we're talking about immigrants and stuff. I was like, oh, okay, like, fair enough. And then I started joining the conversation, sort of giving my, um, my opinion, and then you know, it quickly kind of turned to uh, COVID matters. And I <laughs> couldn't help myself but sort of gauge. They were, well, they're talking about the government, actually. They're talking about we can't trust the government and people in power. And one of them said he he asked his mother, who was his mother was like a, a member of the local, um, not parliament, but the local whatever the local MPs are involved with in you know, the local governance of her area. And he he said he asked his mother one time, when's the last time you actually trusted or liked a, a guy in charge in forty years? And she, he said name three, and she couldn't name one, um, which is you know a good thing to know actually when have we actually had a leader that we've actually liked in the in the uk or even you know america as well but anyway that's you know i, I digress got into the conversation anyway you can see how i got hooked into the conversation with these boys they're all in their sort of late 60s it's what it seemed they were like 50 to 70 ish you know but moving pretty decently on their feet started talking to them started talking to them a little bit you know about vaccine scenario and um, could see quite quickly that they were quite of, of the mainstream narrative but actually a couple of the boys were really open um, to hearing my perspective about you know the, the discrimination that's starting to happen against people who are choosing not to and that um, some of the other solutions out there that are not getting the time on on mainstream news that's at the end of the day clearly only only can listen to mainstream news anyway though it was fairly um didn't get heated in any way you know it was both listening to each other's size and carried on to talk anyway I thought oh you know we'll come up on a hill you know it's been nice talking to these boys but I'm going to get on with my walk now like I said that in my head I thought I'm going to crack on so when we get to this hill um, they'll probably slow up and I'll just carry on and I'll say you know good day like good to chat to you and, and carry on but I was getting quite close with them I actually quite enjoyed their company um, and I was out on my own but anyway it got to the hill started climbing the hill they were going the exact same same pace as me they were they weren't slowing down they what they, they weren't uh short of breath it got to the top of the hill i was ended up chatting to one of them the other two weren't far behind we stopped for you know, a minute or two they caught up and we carried on so it wasn't like there's some crazy lag and they were actually out doing a 13 mile route which included penny fan and i looked at my book and it didn't like it didn't have penny fan in it was a shorter route and there's sort of two summits before Penny Fan where I, I was supposed to take a cut to the left on this kind of saddleback between two peaks. I was like, there's kind of these rolling peaks. Drop down, come up. Fanny Big, drop down, come up. I think it's Cribbin. Drop down and come up on your Penny Fan. And I was supposed to come off before Cribbin. So two before Penny Fan. And I, I was enjoying the company. And, you know, they found out one of them's 69, one of them's 67. That's Simon and... Um, Steve and then Keith was a little bit younger but still in his 60s close to retirement must be nearly 65 so I thought oh, you know what I'm having a good crack with these boys I'll carry on with them so I carried on walking with them did the next few ridges got to the top of Penny Fan and I thought you know what I'll probably pop off on the descent because I might want to go a little bit faster but it just never felt right it felt like it would have been rude to leave them at that point we've come this far we got to the summit um I'll just stick with me. Stopped and had some food. Well, we stopped and had some food. I thought after we have the food, then I'll pop off. And I thought actually it's it's a bit flat here, and we're all walking at the same pace. I just end up staying with them um, for the rest of that bit. And they were telling me stories how they they'd done this for sixteen years in a row. Um, they always come as a group and do this walk, this thirty mile walk with about nine hundred meters, a thousand meters of climb in the whole loop, and it, you know it takes a good day out, five or six hours. Um, and they'd, some of them had done the national three peaks. One of them had done the national three peaks with literally no training with the group of them, um, which is the highest mountain in Scotland, the highest mountain in England, and the highest mountain in Wales in 24 hours is the goal. So you've got um, Ben Nevis, Scarfell Pike, and then Snowdon normally to finish if you do it north to south. Or some people do it south to north, although it's less common um, within 24 hours. And they'd, they'd all done that. 
two of them had actually done the national four, uh, five peaks, which is then you have 48 hours to do those three plus the highest mountain in Northern Ireland, which I do not know the name of, and the highest mountain in Ireland, Karen Tuhill, which I, I've been to once. They'd actually done all five in 48 hours before. Incredibly impressive feat. And the fact that these guys are doing this every year, and you know, they've done, that was within the last five or 10 years they'd done those, those national, or oh, maybe 10 years ago, something like that, the national, you know, national five peaks. I'm impressed, you know. I, there's not often I'm on a mountain and I see um, some gentlemen of around their age that are, A, it's rare to see them, like, well, so sprightly, for one. You may see them occasionally, but they may be going up the easier route, doing a shorter route. Uh, they may be, you know, going at a slower pace. But to see these, these boys, this sort of age, to be moving like this was very impressive um, and inspiring. I was like, that's that's kind of goals for me, you know. And I looked at, I was obviously, I can't help myself, looking at their, their gait, the way they walk, um, their posture when they stand still. Two of them very biomechanically looked very, very good, very healthy, very within the lines of, of natural alignment from, from my current perspective as I've learned and as I see it. The other one was a little out of that and he seemed to have a bit more issues and seemed to be you know struggling a little more towards the end um but he was just you know incredibly stubborn chap keith fair play to him and anyway I, it had me thinking like that is goals and yet that is so rare to see and they're telling me they you know they've had groups of 15 or 20 in the past and now there's just three of them and what is the difference between the fact that these guys are still going and you know incredibly cheery and just as fast as a 33 year old uh mountain man as you know i'm not quite a mountain man but you know i do love the mountains and they're, they're, these guys are more than double my age and equally sprightly that is is wonderful to see and and the reason they are able to there's you know there's so many reasons because it's they've gotten to that stage in life without the maybe they didn't have injuries that other ones had that you know 10 years after the injury happened the that's when the body started to slow down because often when we're younger we have injuries we don't necessarily do the proper rehab or whatever we don't really know what rehab is um and then we get on with life and then 10 years later you're like oh that knee that hurt 10 years ago it's starting to get worse now and i don't really know what to do i'll go to the mainstream physio and then I'll do some leg presses or something like that and that doesn't seem to quite help or that ankle that bum ankle that I've got that was you know I was able to get by for years and now it's starting to play up now when I get up from sitting down for a few hours I have to warm it up before I can move or when I wake up to go pee in the night I have to you know I have to limp over or hop over or something like that and yet some of us some of these this older generation just happened to make it through but this is the thing is, this is rare. Unfortunately, this is rare. They've, they've made it through the lottery, the minefield of getting into older age without someone giving them a bad tackle when they played football when they were younger or without... Um, there's emotional trauma that could have happened to some people as well that tightened up the stomach, which made their hip pull on one side. There's all sorts of reasons that, that we can get through and or not get through. Um, but for me, I... I want to be one of them. I want to be that age and still confident that I could go out with my friends, with my mates, drive two hours to a mountain and get there and not be worried that I might not make it through the first hill because my knee might give out. I, I want to be that age and be able to play with um, you know, children or grandchildren or you know, continue to to have some semblance of movement. Now, there's not some crazy goals of, you know, doing ultra marathons at that age or something, but I would, I'd like to still feel active and confident day to day on my feet and not have to worry about the things I sign up to do. Um, for me, that this is what what has driv what drives me. This is one of, one of the daily reflections that I've come across. You know, there's many. 
I didn't need to see this necessarily to be driven. The, the drive I have for this, for what I'm after, and this is you know biomechanics. I guess we'll get into that's the the, the point of today's talk is why biomechanics. But I guess I should you know let's go to what is biomechanics as I as I see it. You know I've not got you could Google the definition or, or something if you wanted, um, and you might get a clearer answer. I've not done that. I didn't need that to understand that basically some people have niggles. Some people have worse than niggles. They have injuries. They have lifelong problems that they don't remember when it started and yet it affects them every single day. It stops them doing the sports they love. And the current solutions for these I do not find very satisfactory. That's not to say they never work or they... They don't work. Some of them do work, but the the main the amount of people myself I've gone to different um, physios. The amount of people I know, like, I don't really know many people that aren't dealing with some sort of um, physical ailment in some way, injury, niggle or something that they're trying to fix, or that if it was fixed, they might have different aspirations in life. They might do more outdoor stuff. They might play a sport that they love that they had to give up. They might rather than sitting in the pub and just being a sports fan, they might be able to play sports. We all, there's not a human that wouldn't prefer really to, to play, if they had to choose one or the other, play sports or watch sports. Like, mm, I think we'd all pretty much play, you know. Or, or do neither. Someone else might be passionate for art and this is not relevant to them potentially. Um, but again, even someone who does art or is a musician might have a, a back problem that they would like to fix. They wouldn't want to, want to be able to sit comfortably for hours and not have to worry about their back um, having to stand up and stretch every 30 minutes because their back's going to tighten up because the, the children can sit and paint and draw and they can, children can sit on solid, hard, you know, wooden chairs for hours and hours. And I don't, I don't know the last time I sat on a hard platform for more than, you know, 10, 20 minutes, especially without fidgeting or needing to stand up. And yet, at some point, some humans can absolutely do that. You go into, have been, you know, Africa or wherever, Asia, um, and people literally sit. I remember in Ghana seeing these women working in a factory, and they just sat on hard stools and they just sat there for hours on end because they've they've not undone the body's natural alignment that it has that ability to do that. So we all, at some level, have an ability, had an ability younger we've got an ability to be comfortable in what we would now deem in a western world as uncomfortable uncomfortable setting um, because we never avoided that now how do we get back to that for me biomechanics just to, let's go right back to the start people know what a mechanic does like a car mechanic or a bike mechanic that will fix the technology of the car the technology this hardware technology the mechanics of, you know, or a crane. It's got mechanics to a crane that can use levers and weights and pulleys and things to move move things. So the human body, all natural bodies, a fly, a squirrel, you know, a cheetah, an eagle, have mechanical design, in my eyes, designed by God or um, who knows if at a certain level of being you know, in the angelic realm, celestial realms, they're able to create uh, animals. You know, maybe there's a certain level you can get to where you can create an animal and have it uh, live on earth, but it has to follow certain laws of God that they are harmonious within and symbiotic within nature that exists anyway. So everything has mechanical makeup. The human body has a mechanical makeup, bio sort of meaning organic does it mean organic something like that you know natural the fibers that are here when we're, we're born so the biomechanics of of for me human biomechanics the anatomy of the human body how does it function how does it design to move we there's cadaver science where they could open dead bodies and they look at the muscles and the ligaments and the joints and the skeletal system, you know, the structure and how the organs and everything work and the intestines and everything through the middle and you've got the nerves and everything. And, you know, more recently they started to discover the fascia which wrapped around muscles like the sausage sheaths. Um, 
and start, people starting to understand that's becoming a lot more prominent now in, in biomechanical research is the fascia, which is something which, you know, even da Vinci was cutting up cadavers and fascinated in the human body and the human foot and all of that. I don't know if he was really understood about the fascia. It's, so there's, there is an accelerated um, awareness or discoveries of biomechanics now because of the internet, because of all these different you know, Western and Eastern philosophies come, able to come together right now. But for me, biomechanics is the science of the human body and how of the, of the physical, of the movement of the human body. And so to recognise its design, and I have to shout out Functional Patterns for pointing this out to me, they were the one that brought, highlighted to me the design of the human body is to move, right? It's to walk. The primary function of the muscles and the skeleton, as far as we see it currently, or I see it, is, and many people see it, is to walk, and then beyond that is to run. And then you can you know, go into hunting and all that stuff if you want, throwing um, the sticks, stones and ropes, throwing... Um, we threw sticks and stones and, yeah, the evolution of our hunting abilities and stuff, which, you know, I'm not so sure on the history of all that stuff or the, or the initial intentions of the design, but that is what, certainly what it's been used for. You know, there's the, the fight and flight element we can look at, the flight being running, like, the, for me, the epitome of that being someone like Killian Journey, and then you've got the fight element of, how people use the body to generate momentum from the foot out of the fist with as much speed as they can to, you know, un knock someone else unconscious, which is certainly, you can have discussions about how <laughs> unloving that is a use, but it's, it's the way humans have used the body. But for me, the flight is the predominant purpose of it, is the movement patterns, how it is designed. And it was only when I got into running that I really started to recognize my own, um, what's the word, sort of incompleteness, and that's not the right word, but the, my own lack of natural good alignment in my biomechanics, because it's, you can do other sports, um, and it may not be, you know, you could have a bad ankle and play darts, or golf maybe, or something like that, or you could have a, a bad shoulder and play football, so you could be biomechanically out of line and still get by in, within certain parameters of the sports that we play. But something like running, to me, as simple and, and boring as it may be on the outside to many people, is the epitome of good biomechanics, of um, good expressive performance, of, of how someone's biomechanics are, perform are, are working and how within the parameters of natural alignment they are functioning um, and has developed. And so when I got into running, you know, after years of playing on my hands and breakdancing and free running and then I eventually signed up to an obstacle race and figured if I can run then I could do well at this obstacle race and then started to run and then quickly got knee issues and ankle issues and hip strains and all sorts started to look at that a little bit more. Why can't I run with that injury? I could, you know, I could do free running and generally was quite okay. Um, but, I mean, I was younger and there's other elements as, as well to that which can be revisited. But running highlighted anything for me that was out of line, that was out of sync. And so that has then become, and like I say, highlighted by functional patterns and others since, was highlighted to myself and that put me on that path that then aligned me with those practices <clears throat> running is the blueprint running is the blueprint for us to test for me you know and this is the current thinking I, I, you know it can always change you could say it's walking you could say it's an egotistical desire like you know you're not your body let go of the body uh, all this, all the discussions that you know, I'm not, not here to have those chats right now. This is about um, the expression of human movement in its simplest, rawest form at a highest level is running, and so that is the blueprint for to map someone's gait cycle. And then there's so many discussions within that because you've got so many different philosophies on running um, from. Uh, people like David Weck who calls it locomotion 2.0 where you do it you double down pulks with your hands as you run and that loads the connective tissue in the Achilles that bounces you forwards 
using gravity to shoot down to bounce forward to you know Shane Benzie um, and his stuff which I've not looked too deeply into to chi running and, and um, that style of running which I've done a chi running course once before and um, the Michael Johnson your whole torso should stay completely straight and your limbs should swing and drive you forward and that Usain Bolt is wasting energy and he could be faster if he ran like the way the Americans run to um, the go-to philosophy of everything spiraling and the heels drive away and you know there's so many different things within that but they're all fascinated within the same thing and you know maybe there are different answers for the same thing you know but I do believe there's some semblance of uh, ultimate truth or efficiency within that movement um, that maybe in the next few years we may get to as as all these practices are appearing and the speed of the internet and all these different practitioners are trying each one and then people are moving on from one practice to another which is sort of my journey is experimenting with them all and seeing which ones make the most sense which ones complement each other which ones uh, go against each other in their beliefs and their philosophies so Biomechanics to me is that is the is there's a is that study of movement and then there's so many other expressions of functionality. That's the ultimate expression of functionality. Is you know how far can you run, how fast. There's there's the endurance debate and then there's the speed debate and they come down to different discussions as well. And then there's like I said, fight the art of flight and the art of fight fight or you could go to me something like dance maybe that's a a more um truer loving alternate end of the spectrum to flight to running is dance and that expression and that would lead me right back to something like breakdancing and my obsession and fascination with that where they are generating talk and whip and using that and using timing and rhythm and uh, bounce and pulsations and gyrations to something like tricking where they are taking off on one leg swinging the other leg as fast as they can in a kicking motion but then you know using that energy to go in on itself to rotate not only upside down but spinning as well you know two or three rotations in a double or triple cork to then open out to land perfectly back on that one single ball of the foot that they took off on in a balanced position knowing where they are in space with proprioception to to then go again and rotate again and do another you know multiple corkscrews back to back that these guys do or double corks back to back and with some kicks and other other expressions in between so there are these other joyous expressions to go down with expressions of, of functional biomechanics and parkour itself in in the rawest form of efficient movement from a to b the way david bell kind of intended it to be in the beginning um to then free running the the creative expression on that, if that's your definition of that. But for me to strip it right back, because I because within the simplest thing you can get the the most out of it. Because there's so when you see anyone running in the street, you'll barely see the same form twice. You literally won't see the same form twice. And yet these all are able to run, but then they all have you know different abilities of running. And there's other factors, you know, of course, genetics is a factor. There's childhood, you know, is a factor. But then there's other things like just training harder. And this, for me, is a big point of discussion, which I'll, I'll get into later in the podcast, is something like the David Goggins attitude um, of just, just, you know, override your mind and just push your body harder and harder, train harder. Um, and it's push yourself, you know, override that thought. There's definitely a, a time and a place for Goggins. Like, there's, he's, got, he's got... There's value to some of his message because we can be too... Um, sometimes potentially too fragile. But at the same time, I think that attitude can get so many people injured fast if they don't... He's got good biomechanics... He was carry, he was weighed so much more for years, carrying around so much more weight. Had natural alignment with that big weight, lost the weight. Now he just has a beast of a body, <laughs> like he's like grew up with extra pounds on him, and then with good biomechanics. If you don't have good biomechanics and you just take that Goggins attitude, I've been there. I've done that. I did. I've done marathon and ultra marathons, hundred kilometer races and fifty five kilometer mountain races, and got 
injured and had the knee surgery. I've had knee surgeries from free running and then a knee surgery from running in the mountains because I wasn't listening to my body because I was a, a combination of um, addicted to the practice, which you know may obviously still be playing out somewhat, but I'm more humble in that approach. Hopefully, get you know maybe somewhat more um, in my approach to that, in my trying to honour the body first and its desires, and so as a combination of you know wanting to just line up a start race of a mountain race over and over again, regardless of how my body felt, and then using my mind to just override it, say, yep, yeah, as long as I get started. Doesn't matter how I wake up in the morning, how I get out of bed, feeling stiff, um, because once I warmed up, I can still go, and that that is literally the the shift in mindset I had that changed my whole path and my trajectory of of my um, life path, my career, my my goals. Was I I see too many? I saw other free runners as well doing doing the same, having to take. Uh, painkillers waking up you know limping out of bed and then once they warm up and they've got the painkillers they can train um other athletes do the same thing they can take you know, that's that i mean i don't really hang out with many people that too much do that but they, that's a very common thing out in the world where how many martial artists probably just take painkillers to get through the training practice and they are just writing checks that eventually are going to come crash the someone's going to come knocking on the door because they're not paying that and that's going to it's basically going to be the body shutting down and saying right you're 30 now. Remember all those times you just took the painkillers and not ignored what was happening? Yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. The next 30 years is mine. That's it. You're not. You're gonna. You're gonna try all the surgeries and stuff you want, but it's not gonna get you anywhere. It's just gonna. You're gonna be boxing yourself in a, into a smaller and smaller box as you go. And that's what it. That's what it. I started to recognize in myself. The walls felt like they were closing in. I was ignoring the little signs, listening, the little niggles in my body. And I was like, you know what? No more. I'm got, this is, I want, I want to feel like that, that, you know, and this could go back to, again, a, a desire that's not possible, but yet I still believe it is. And that still drives me, but somewhat of being able to train daily and wake up feeling excited for the day to train again and to enjoy, or to practice again, to practice movement, to play. Um, to play with the human body. The human body is the one thing you were born with in this world. You weren't born with the house over your head. I mean, you may have been born with the house over your head, but that wasn't given to you by by the nature of the laws of which, you know, the human comes into the earth. You weren't born with the, um, the car in your driveway, the 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 trainers on your feet or whatever, you were born with a human body. And yet we're so, I don't know, I can't project that onto people, but just generally we don't respect that. We cover up spots with makeup. We cover up, you know, pain with painkillers. We cover up bad knees with bandages. We know which there is a time and a place and things like that. We cover up, our feet to separate it from the earth with shoes. We cover up our genitals, um, which is a whole, you know, the whole taboo of what that creates, this separation from nudity, like we're not all naked under our clothes, that then creates the this lustful uh, culture where, you know, the sun exists with page three to the porn that exists to then, you know, Japan where sex is even more of a taboo, where it has even weirder porn. Because the more you kind of resist, the more something persists and it manifests in much stranger ways. We are born with a human body that has been designed. We don't. It's amazing how much people can respect the design. You know, I, a phone is amazing. It's an incredible piece of technology. No one of us would know where to start with designing that. The... TV is an incredible piece of technology. The car, a car, which is hardware compared to you know the software stuff, is a whole other league that we don't even know where that came. We come from ETs or what? You know who knows? But the, you know, even a bicycle, which we can just start to understand with the way the, the gears work and the, the spokes and the cogs and the, the tires and the, you know. We can kind of understand a bike 
and the gears and the way that functions and how the bigger gears um, make the the, pe- the pedals spin faster when you go into the bigger cogs or whatever. Um, or the other way around. <laughs> the other way around. We can kind of grasp that. The human technology is... We, you know, then you, a car, not many of us could probably grasp that. And then you go to like the TV or the internet, it's just going over a head. Well, the human body is trumps all of that. And that's just the, phys- just the movement part of it alone, let alone the mind and the organs and the heart, you know, and beyond the physical, you know, then you go into the, the soul, you know, all the, those levels of things. Just the body alone and its ability to function and run and to last... You know, the cartilage that exists between joints, that soft, you know, cushions between bones that can last and regenerate for a lifetime if it's, you know, treated with respect. It's a gift. It's an absolute gift. And I'm, you know, maybe unhealthily obsessed, but it's what I'm passionate with, with understanding that. And as far as I can see, most of us have unfortunately abused it or ignored it somewhat as of as of i as i did for many years and so wanting is my desire to understand it more to look at all the other people that are as passionate as me that are trying to help solve it that want to have answers to share to other people to help them because they're not satisfied with the current uh, mainstream cadaver science perspective on the human body on its design and makeup that are looking at fascia and ways to train fascia and ways to train patterns and ways to strengthen uh, joints and, and strengthen ligaments and tendons and so that we can have longevity and do the things that we uh, enjoy and love to do for longer and be around for those that we love in a stronger way, physically stronger way. Um, it's... It's tough because there's a lot of my parents just say, you know, you get older, your joints wear down, you get arthritis. It's just the way, it's just genetics. It's just bad luck. And I just didn't like that, that outlook. I just believe that there's no, there's, there's got to be a reason. There's got to be a reason for everything to happen. And that's driven much of this, is understanding it. Not to say that I'll, I can solve it all or that I won't get old and have issues that might plague me that I might not be able to fix but at least for now if I approach it now at least for those listening you know start why not start now and begin to to live in alignment and in in harmony and love of your body and what it was designed to do and what it can do and see what that can unearth and so that is so much of my drive is is having that faith that there are answers out there and there are people that are as driven as me, but that actually their minds, because I don't necessarily think I'm the one that could, I couldn't come up with the system raw, like some of these other systems that I've come across. I'm a mate, I'm like, that is so genius. But I can at least bring my openness, my open mind and my understanding of movement and that raw um, sort of talent that, I, that I, I've been gifted from young, that connection I have to movement, that I can bring that to this movement, to this to this biomechanical movement that's happening around the world, around the internet right now, and see what I can, you know, try all the different systems and be honest and humble in my approach and understanding and try not to get too attached to any one of them or arrogant in the beliefs of any one of them and caught up in that and and try to piece this puzzle together. And maybe I'm not the one that creates systems, but I could help you know, piece the puzzle with all the rest of the community out there that are trying to do it as well. Um, Because that, what serves me can serve others, you know, is in in that weird way that sort of selfishness uh, funneled right, channeled right, channeled with some, you know, love, is part of the formula, you know, love for myself, love for my body, love for the design God has made with the human body or who, you know, 
I can have answers that serve others as well. And then I can teach it to others in efficient ways because I've gone down so many dead end roads. I've spent so many months trying things and systems and, and to, to get to learn that that's not the way. And that goes for everything from diet and everything as well, you know. I'm a canary in a coal mine. I, I'm experimenting and trying to evaluate. And and the thing is, you know, what someone's system that might work for some people doesn't work for others. What's the deal there, <laughs> you know? Some people might have um, a glute, a, a fascia connection from the foot to glute. So then when they do a certain system, that works. And someone else, you know, this is... Well, I'll talk about in a in future episode, I want to talk about this, but like someone like Weck, who I think has got an incredible fascial network around his body, intense integrity from all of his years of, of training. He's trying to teach stuff to people who don't have that makeup. You go, oh, he's got a body, I've got a body, therefore double down pulse should work. Well, he's got this Spider-Man, you know, tense, fascially uh, integrated suit from his toes all the way up his glutes to his abs, wherever it goes. And so when he does double down pulls, it just bounces him like a, like a, you know, bouncy ball. And then someone else tries it and it just hurts their ankles. Uh, me, basically. <laughs> double down pulls that have not got, but that's not to say it doesn't work for some humans and it can't work for others, but it's in how, okay, what's the missing link there? How, how do we get from, uh, you know, Joel Solo to a weck? How do we get the body from there to there? Because he's, you know, he's so far out in the front that so many people go, oh, he's either crazy or that doesn't work for me, so it doesn't work. And it's like, no, it's obviously, like, not obviously, but I, I believe him is, I believe it's doing something I can see in his movement patterns. If you have that that eye, when, when a 51-year-old man with a replaced hip can run the way he runs and move the way he moves, <laughs> it's doing something, but there's something, there's a missing link here from many of us to him. What's that, you know, is that secrets of athleticism is that is that where what we need to do or need to do first is that go to is that flowability is that functional patterns is that um <clears throat> knees over toes or body by sight you know what are all these all these different things which I, I will in a future episode i'm going to do on sort of cross-referencing all the different systems that i've practiced um, but for now it was just what and why is, is this one what is biomechanics for to me why get into biomechanics it's a lot of us have heard this word mobility come about it's in the last five years it's become very trendy and then you get all the animal flows and things that, that come off of that like I, I got into yoga probably about eight or nine years ago now because I had tight muscles and I realized if my muscles weren't as tight well I mean I tried to stretch when I was younger let it go of that then yoga seemed like the approach oh there's a whole practice about stretching Oh, cool! I wanted to be more flexible. Well, if you stretch, you get more flexible. Uh -uh. Stretching doesn't make you mm -mm, directly more flexible, or as it relates to positive movement necessarily, it can make you like passively more mobile. But that doesn't necessarily make you it more functional to the human body. You know, for me, it's all about functional mobility. It's not about placidity, like being is that word placid, like just this empty muscle with nothing in it that you can just flop, like floppy. You know, I want to be mob mobile as it relates to strength, you know, the, the combination of the two. Um, so, yeah, quickly from yoga, like, oh, my muscles are tight. If I stretch them, if my muscles are more f longer or stretch them, then I'll feel better. No, you can't just... My body just resisted that for years and years of, of doing yoga, trying to stretch, force it there's a missing link, there's a missing key to that. Now, is that Udhyana Banda? Is that, does yoga work for, you know, Indian 14-year-old boys a thousand years ago who, who lived barefoot and have got a fascia foot-to-glute foot connection, so therefore the body can allow them to stretch, whereas I don't have, maybe I don't have that. You know, these are the questions we'll, I'm starting to come to now that I think are important questions. For me, anyway, I, f I think they're interesting questions, you know. Like there's a missing link between why yoga worked for these people but then and why it doesn't work why does it work for some people now um, and yet it doesn't work for other people you know I don't think that it's an idiotic practice at all I think these guys had a lot of time to themselves without the internet and were in tune with the body and they created a practice that did something positive for them for their spirit maybe you know 
for the meditation practice. There was a place for it that, that served them to just dismiss yoga and say, oh no, it's stupid. You're making the muscles placid and, and lengthening them against functionality. Well, no, maybe there's a way, you know, maybe it is Odiana Banda, maybe it's some Tai Chi type thing where, where it is um, engage the fascia and then stretch. Get the breathing into your upper back rather than your chest or your belly and stretch. Nose breathing, not mouth. But, you know, there's so many elements. The way it's come down through the lineages is, is not the same as it was once taught. And then beyond not being the same as it was once taught, we are not the same bodies we were before soft shoes came about, before sofas came about, before soft beds came about. We're not the same bodies. Before um, chemical you know, processed foods existed before vegetable oils were in our food, running havoc around our, running havoc around our body. Before sugar was such a common place thing. Before, you know, alcohol. Uh, well, alcohol's been around, I guess, but uh, you know, chocolate was so accessible, and um, coffee was so accessible, and all these different things that may, I mean, not to say that's definitely having necessarily having a negative effect on the body, but there are you know, vegetable oils and sugars and all this other stuff which is doing wreaking havoc to our bodies and our joints along with all this, the comforts of the footwear and everything else, we're not the same body, so the same practice wouldn't work. There might be a missing link, a step we need to do before the yoga works, if that's what we want to do, if that's what our goal or whatever. But maybe we don't need that. But the, or there might be a more a modern version of that with the transverse abdominus, which is Odiana Banda, the TVA. There might be a more modern version to go with our modern lifestyle, not, not to use more technology, but that's, that it's... That it's the, is it the Minotaur, Perseus, Theseus, was it Theseus that went to find the Minotaur and left the string? That's us, that's us as humanity going down this <laughs> maze and I'm trying to follow the string back out to where, to, this is what, this is exactly rediscover, <laughs> I've just coined um, the purpose of rediscover human rediscover human it's following the string back out of minotaur's layer <laughs> to get back out of this place because we're headed down into the beast the belly of the beast right now and i'm trying to just use this string to reverse engineer to rediscover what what the potential of us as are why, why we're on this planet to the best that i can do within this lifetime um and share that and I, it's time that i stepped up to share that and that's what i'm trying to do now with this conversation and for me there's three sciences that I that that I enjoy: science of the body, science of the spirit, and science of the soul. Now there are much greater teachers for uh, the other stuff. I can just relate what I'm learning and what I find fascinated in. And we're going to get into the science of the spirit and the science of the soul. Um, but science of the body is something that I've been obsessed about for for longer. And, you know, I think the science of the soul trumps everything because that supersedes it all. If you, if you work on the soul level, every, that, ra that raises everything else. Whereas if you work on a physical level, that doesn't necessarily raise the soul. Um, but, it, you know, I feel like it can, depending on how you're working with love and whatever other things you learn along the way, with, you're working with humility. Um, and so for me... What has happened with biomechanics? If you had a car and you bent the axle by one degree and then you had another car exactly the same and didn't bend the axle and they both drove off, which car is going to stop first? They may both go a very long way. You know, maybe you give it to... to Twins and they go about their life. Not that twins live exactly the same way. <laughs> Mute point there, but the car with the one degree bent axle is going to break down before the car with the out the bent axle. By one degree, you you can, and nothing else is different on the same roads. Everything that's going to end first. That is how the body is. Many of us had our axle bent in an injury, never realigned it properly, because we either didn't care about it neglected it or didn't try to re realign it but didn't have the best methods at hand you know many reasons but we didn't realign that and then that one axle being out 
in the body then made something else had to another compensate another part of the body had to change because the ankle's out now the hip has to turn in to balance that out because it, it's always seeking homeostasis it's seeking that that balance so it can actually function so when we move we have safety bumpers which for me is what tight muscles is or tight fascia is something is out of line so then that ping pongs around the body so then something on the you know from the ankle to the hip hip could be to the opposite shoulder or it goes from one side to the other to stay balanced the right hips further forward to the left shoulder sits further back to stay to balance that out and this from this there's so many of these the kind of chinese handcuffs around the body that are holding one thing holding another thing in place and then that holding it and so you can kind of reverse engineer through like for me it was my knees but my knees but they say the knee is just it's never a knee issue it's an ankle or a hip issue because the knee's just floating between the ankle and the hip so then you go okay so then I've got to work on that I've got to work on that it's like um when we move and there's a perfect natural alignment that we can move in that you know children without traumas and injuries would move in and certain tribes people that lived that live without footwear and stuff move in much more close to this you know if you had a 100% perfect model of natural alignment and then it's like bowling a strike when you move when my arm swings when my leg swings it's going perfectly in alignment that's not to say it's perfectly straight you know there's spirals there's figure of eights in the joints that's meant to happen with every step but you can just to just linearize it you're bowling a strike when you move now you have an injury your your ankle goes out so then the bumper plates go up. You're bowling. You're not. <laughs> you're. You're. You know. You're not bowling very straight. You're bowling gutter balls now. Your ankle's out. We need to put the bumper plates up. Right. The fascia gets tight. So now you've got a tight muscle. So now you try to. Oh, my muscle's tight. I'm gonna just uh, my fascia release. I'm gonna poke it with a ball. I'm gonna f- foam roll it. But it's the bumpers are there because you you can't bowl straight anymore. You're bowling gutter balls, and it doesn't, you know, ultimate gutter ball is a, is a snap leg. You know, if the ball goes in the gutter, you break your leg. So we're going to put the bumper plates up to protect this guy. Okay, so the bumper plates are up in my body. The, bumper, the bumpers are up on the bowling alley in my body. I've got tight fascia, tight muscles. Right, we need to, how can I, my, my shooter's out of whack my sense of what I think is straight and what is actually straight is not, is not right. How can I rebalance the body, restate, you know, because some muscles are there to stabilize, some muscles are prime movers, you know, you've got the glutes, pecs, big muscles do big jobs. Then you've got the glute med, the side butt, which is there to stabilize. Now, a lot of us, because of, you know, a muscle an injury happened a compensation happened in our movement the way we move isn't quite aligned anymore so now a stabilizer has to do a main mover's job now that's a problem so now it has to it has to go right i better buckle up i better put on some safety gear to do this job i better you know fascia support me get tight protect around me so that I, i've got to do this job that i'm not designed to do but you know what God built a backup plan so that I could get by. <laughs> I'm allowed to do this job. It's not going to be the most efficient. It's not going to be perfectly aligned. We'll get by. We won't be able to win any marathons, but you know what? We'll get through the day-to-day tasks. And that's what's happened in so many of us. We're just living with these bumper plates that make us feel heavier, that make us move, feel slower and stiffer and less free in our movement. And that's, that's something I'm like, okay, well, let's try and, hey, buddy, you know what, I love you. Um, I'm going to learn how to move with alignment. I'm going to learn how to align my posture. And that, you know, when I talk about biomechanics and that path, is, a lot of the, is going to be a lot of the physical stuff, the physical practices. That's not to, you know, the soul work, the emotional work is a whole different discussion, which I'm not an expert in, um, but I'll share my perspective on it, my opinion. Um, but that, cannot be neglected because there's emotional reasons for this stuff to happen as well it's not just physical injuries like I say someone could have a self 
uh, worth issue from childhood, from the way the parents treated them, and then that creates a knot in the stomach that then, you know, permeates. You know, the 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 chakras are, sh- are shut down. They they weren't allowed to speak their opinion, so their throat chakra is shut down. So then, you know, they get throat cancer or something. You know, there's so many different things, but and it's a complicated conversation. <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm gonna share the best of my life I still but there's still work to be done with the bodies that's that straight body work alongside the other stuff that I'm passionate and care a lot about and I want to share that with people um because we're at the cusp of all this right now and like I say bi- mobility is a big word mobility became a huge word five years ago oh I need to improve my mobility all these mobility courses and everything and, and really the word is but for me it's biomechanics and I think that would be the word you start to see a lot more of in the, in the near future now but it's just how everything relates, how the skeletal system and the muscular system, how do they relate? Because if they're out of whack, then that's, to sum that up, you know, there's a way they were both designed to work together, the muscles and the skeleton, you know, and that's not to count the, you know, the fascia as well, that's a whole other part of it, and the ligaments and everything, but to simplify it, the, the skeleton and the muscles were designed to work a certain way. Now, if one muscle gets tight, the whole system ch- changes, the whole system has to adapt. So that pulls everything out of line. So it's getting that whole thing to back to alignment, to function together. Um, I listened to a podcast recently with Rob Deerdeck. And he, someone I really admired growing up in childhood, I used to watch Rob and Big on MTV, which was quite a funny show. He's a, he was a skateboarder, a DC athlete, and then he got his own show on MTV with uh, his bodyguard, Big Black, RIP. Then they did an MTV series called Rob's Fancy Factory, Rob did Fancy Factory, and he had a massive warehouse in LA, and he got to build anything he wanted in this warehouse, within obviously the budget they had, but they just looked like they had so much fun, creative, he was just, like a, he used his imagination, like a kid, he was, you know, laughing all the time, and it just, it was like, oh man, I would love a warehouse like that, to build like parkour stuff, and have fun, and whatever, anyway, I hadn't, I hadn't seen him in years, but I just remember, he was a part of my childhood, my friend Scott sent me it, podcast said this is really good this guy's talking about biomechanics i said oh rob, rob deerdeck talking about biomechanics it's like of course he's on this path years later you know he's someone who's not i mean not of course but it's it was like it didn't surprise me that someone who was passionate about you know skateboarding and movement and had i mean he had a lot more a lot of money to invest but that wanted to solve his biomechanics and he was saying oh he started to fix his posture Thought it'd be a few months and he'd be done. He's like, five years later, he's like, I stand on the precipice of perfect biomechanics. He said, it took a lot longer than I thought, but I have a a coach come five days a week and I work on my posture. And he said, he's had blood work done the whole way through since he started. And just recently, he's got zero inflammation in his body and his IBS went away, irritable bowel syndrome. He said, all he changed... All he's fixed was his posture. Didn't change his diet. His blood markers all changed from changing his posture. I screamed when I heard, like, I was in the car driving. It's actually the day I drove to Penny Fan. I was listening to that while I was driving (laughs) to bring it back to that same day. Well, I, like, yelled and cheered because I was like, yes, yes. That's exactly what I suspected. As what I suspected, he's, he's ahead of the game once again and proven it to himself. Anecdotally, but there's one guy saying it, and I feel like I was on the cusp of saying it as well. And this is, this is the start of something. By fixing his posture, by rebalancing his nat- himself towards natural alignment and the way his body functions biomechanically, his gut issues went away. His inflammation went away. That is exactly what I've, ex- I've experienced anecdotally within the last two months of starting the practice that I'm doing, of my posture becoming better, of my of rebalancing my my ribs and my pelvis the alignment between the ribs and the pelvis is so crucial because that contains your, every, all of your organs that do all of your digestive work and everything you know lungs and breathing as well in between if that relationship between your ribs and your pelvis is not the way it was designed to do any degrees out is going to have any degrees of detrimental effect potentially most likely if you've got a compressed lower back like i had and still have to a degree, but it's so much better. Your liver and your kidneys are getting squashed in the back. Your, whatever's at the front is that your intestines getting stretched out at the front. 
it's all plumbing inside. It's all plumbing. If you bend the hose pipe when someone's trying to water the garden, the water doesn't come out. If you crush your organs when they're trying to function and they need space to float and function, they're not going to function the same way. If they're squashed up against each other, it's not going to have room to breathe that it needs to do the thing that it does. Since I have worked on my posture and found a practice that I've found more, the most beneficial that exists out there to my current beliefs, I've been able to eat less than what... I, I, when I used, to, I used to eat a piece of fruit and I'd wake up stiff and cloudy the next day from a piece of fruit. I'd eat a bit of bread and I'd just... My body would stiffen up as well. I've been able to eat a bit more bread. I've been able to eat fruit like five pieces a day sometimes and not wake up stiff and cloudy purely through the biomechanical work. I've obviously someone who's dived into diet and people are asking me at the moment on Instagram, what's, what's your diet like at the moment? And I'm like, my diet's the same as it's been for like a year. If not, I'm eating slightly more, I'm getting away with eating slightly less perfect. But I, you know, my definition of perfect, it was because if I ate fruit, I felt bad and I didn't want that to be perfect. I didn't want to deem a perfect diet for me, the one that made me feel less, I mean, it's going to be the one that makes me feel less bad. And yet fruit made me feel that way. And yet now I can eat fruit and it doesn't. So, you know, I was just following what my body was saying. And that's not to say just change your diet and, and then the food that affects you is going to change. Change your posture. And then what you eat, the way it affects you can change. That's a paradigm shift. That is powerful. That's what no one's really talking about. And that's the power of this, of biomechanics. It's beyond just movement. It's beyond being able to enjoy your sport. It's being able to live more comfortably. That's a game changer. If, if you have those issues, if you have digestion issues and you're just changing your diet and you're getting frustrated because I try carnivore, I try keto, I try Ray Pete, I tried vegan and I just, none of it, this made me feel better. I felt a bit better here, but then this made me, if I ate something like that, it would just ruin me for days. Baby, it's biomechanics. That's a big part of the pie. Big piece of the puzzle. It's a second chance. It's a se- we, I lived for years more mindlessly. Still probably living mindlessly in some elements, but a lot less so, I believe, now. I just want... Just let me, just let me redo that. Give me a, mull- like, a, a second chance. I'm going to say mulligan then. I don't think that's the right... Um, metaphor for it but <laughs> just give me another chance oh there must there must be a way to undo to, to, just let me do a redo on like let me just start doing sports again but i'll just teach myself hey tim don't run that way or do, you know when you get that injury don't you know make sure you rehab it make sure you don't let your foot sway out and then ignore that you know i just wanted a, a second give me a second chance please for me this is part of that you know, it may not be the same, you may not be, you know, can't be a teenager again, but it's a, it's a, hopefully a chance to then play sport again and move freely. Undo all that mindless behaviour and movement that caused damage and do it again. You know, not do the damage again, <laughs> but train again, but with mindfulness. Heighten the, the, the ceiling. Like if, if, you're training, you're hitting a lot of plateaus. You're hitting the ceiling on your training. You're trying to move more weight, but you can't get any further without risk. You feel like you're going to get injured if you add any more weight or you've tried that. Um, you're going to try a new training program, which is just a different you know, rearrangement of the same movements in a different sequence and a different number of things. All these programs like getting you know, people to train in slight you know, moderations of the thing. no. You can do that. You can try that if it's working. Keep do if do what works. Do what works. But if you're tired and frustrated and it's not working, re, this postural training and biomechanical training, in my opinion, for anyone who's dealing with any injuries or wants to make the potential or their potential greater on the physical abilities, it should be fifty percent of your training. Half your training should be focused. Half your time spent training should be focused on realigning your posture, real, be, becoming back to natural alignment. 
50% is an arbitrary number. It could be a third. For me, it's 90% of my training. 10% is a bit of bouldering, I'd say at the moment. 90% is around real, because it's, why not, why not put all that time in now? I mean, mate, you know, maybe, yeah, why not, you know, could do other stuff. But for me right now, well, if this is going to get me to where I want to get faster, why would I not get there the fastest way I know? Why would I not put a year or two into it right now or five years if that's what it takes, like Rob Deerdeck, though I believe the systems in play are, you know, and my current knowledge on it, I could get there faster than he did, but I don't know that. So it could take five years. What's five years now when I could be 67, like Simon, on the mountain hiking Penny Fan with my mates, like a group of roving wild horses who are running along. I remember one run I did in LA, Malibu, State Park, I think it was, with Brendan Brazier, me and him, and we're just running on these trails, my, I was wearing my flame red Vivos at the time, and it was like a 10 mile run, I just remember running this slight down, I love a, the perfect slightly downhill gradient with like soft dirt, not quite sand, a bit firmer than sand, dirt, soft dirt, so it's soft on your feet, and the, the slight incline means that you can just run without any effort. And just work with gravity, or whatever. Say so work. I wouldn't say gravity. You know, neither of those two. But move with you know, descending effortlessly, descending the perfect gradient. Because if it's too steep, it's a lot of work on your legs. If it's flat, you got to work. Running alongside Brendan Brazier, and I was like, this is what running's about. You know, racing is one thing. You can you know race yourself, race your PBs, whatever. But racing another human, and you're like in that energy, that emotion of, right, I've got to overtake this person. That's one thing. That's not really that loving, is it really? Running alongside a friend, nothing like it. In the mountains, nothing like it. I'm telling you, you've got a healthy body, effortlessly running with a homie, a pack of you, like wild horses, all in your own steps, in your own space, but alongside each other, like a pack of wolves, wild horses, whatever you want to see it as group of homies running in one energy together, nothing like it. I want that for myself, I want that for my friends, I want that for other humans that would possibly be drawn to that. For me, this is the path to that right now, that I, as I see it. Running with a friend, running with your girlfriend, running with, yeah, your family, whoever likes to run, running alongside each other, enjoying nature, enjoying the natural ups and downs, ebbs and flows, these dirt trails that thousands of humans have walked on for hundreds of years. There's nothing like it. It's, you know, could say it's a modern privileged thing, first world, look, yeah, all that stuff, maybe, maybe, but it's a joy. It's a joy in your downtime, among your, whatever you have as a service to the, to humanity and your community or people who have, how, yourself, however you serve outside of that, downtime your enjoyment your relaxation whatever a body that can move more effortlessly traversing the landscape god created for us as humans in that mode of appreciation of the earth of your body of your friends Nothing like it. Truly special for me. For me anyway. That's that's my that's you know, won't be for every human. That's what I love. And that's what I, I desire, and that's what I wanna find a way to help myself and all others others reach that. Because right now it's not possible. <laughs> How many of us can right now, hands up, go run ten miles in the mountains effortlessly or you know, without too much some of us can. Some of us listening to this probably can, so big up yourself. You know, you made it through the lottery, through the minefield. Some of us can't. Some of us don't know what that's ever felt like and don't know that we'd want to do it unless we could experience it. And so, you know, whatever you want to do with your biomechanics, that's that could be tennis, football, you know, rugby, baseball, basketball, squash, playing with your child, um, planting trees, gardening. It could be gardening, you know. Jamie, my friend Jamie said he put his lower back out recently, bless him. Like, 
all of these people, everyone, there's not human really, there's some, not rare humans don't have some physical thing that if they knew how the body functioned and it was taught either in school, we could all do. So we could revamp the whole PE system and that goes to everything, you know, patterns of movement taught as well. There's hardware and software. Get the hardware, the, the biomechanics, then the software can come, the patterns and all that stuff can come. Um, so yeah, that's biomechanics and posture. What and why? We weren't born with an instruction manual, but we're trying to write one now. Between all of us, the more we can come together and share our experience and our results, we can write that instruction manual for future generations to enjoy the human body the gift that God gave us in the physical that we're born with. Thank you for listening. See you on the next one. Godspeed.